are going to see and you have to ask him about his ping pong tournament. Well, Taylor, I wish you luck on your endeavours to the hyenas and a very, very warm welcome to Juma and sunny South Africa. It is as sunny as sunny can get. It is bright, it is breezy, and it is very pleasant to be out on a game drive. Now, as Taylor mentioned, my name is Tristan. On camera today, I've got Davi, which is always an absolute pleasure to have on board. And, well, we are going to be trying to see if we can't catch up with Tundi and Cub. So that is the plan for this afternoon. Hopefully we will be able to get some sort of luck with Tandy and Cub this afternoon. We'll have to just try and see. Now remember it is interactive, so hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or the YouTube chat if you want to get hold of us. Now Taylor, you were wondering about our ping pong. Okay Taylor, well our ping pong was delightful. Darby, was it delightful? It was delightful. Now I've got a video to show all of you for those of you that don't know what we're talking about. Today was the ping pong palooza challenge here at Juma. And so what that entailed was basically the following. So I'm going to play you a video and you'll be able to see how this all went. So that is what happened today. So Taylor, it was a very successful event, and you want to know who won? Well, we had a team competition to start, which was the black team. So Davi and I were on the black team with Kirsty and Rebecca and a few others. Who else was in? Eggsy was in our team and Luigi. and Louise. That's right. So it was three girls, three boys, and so the six of us managed to beat the red team but unfortunately the overall winner was a member of the red team and that was James Hendry and I lost to him in the final which was a disaster and you can see there was much celebration after all of that. Right well <laughs> we're going to go and try to find Tundi and Cub now after we worked up a sweat in our ping pong challenge and while we do that I think we're going over to Noel. I'm not 100% sure but either way it will be one of our members of the Safari Live crew for the afternoon. <laughs> It is a very warm, slightly windy afternoon here in South Africa. Tristan, I'm so sorry to hear that you lost against James with Ping Pong Palooza. I sadly was cracking the books today for my practical examination, so I'm glad everyone had a good time. How amazing everyone was that sighting with Brent's cheetah and that warthog. Super jealous, Brent. I hope you get some more action up there. I am Noelle, and on camera to the camera, to, I can't talk. On camera today, I have the Vildebees. VM, hello, thumbs up. So yeah, we're just potting long and waiting for it to cool down a little bit. I'm actually in search for elephants. I'd really like to see some swimming elephants today. So we're checking Biffleswick Dam, and then we're going to head down towards a Chitwa Chitwa and see what we can find along the way. As you know, Tristan's headed over to see if he can find Tundi and her youngster, and then we're hoping that maybe Hasana pops up over on Chitwa side, but you never know what might happen. Also, maybe Shadow and her youngster maybe come up by Twins, Twin Dam, so we'll go and have a look down there. Now, amazingly, our hippo friend is not here in Biffleswick Dam. I don't know where he's gone or where he could be. Maybe he has decided that he is too lonely and needs to go and try and find some females. Or maybe on his feeding out and about this after this uh, last evening, he managed to find a place that just suited him a bit better, but I'm sure he'll be back in a few days. All right, we're going to go check the corner because the other thing I would like to see is maybe the wild dogs. They haven't been over to us for a while. And last time that we saw them, they moved over a bit east. So as we're busy searching, we're going to send you all the way back up to Brent in the Maasai Mara with his cheetahs who are still busy on their kill and I'll let you enjoy the spectacular sighting that that is. about 
that everybody. Gremlins attacking a Brent, but he'll be back with you shortly, not to worry. For those of you that don't know what a gremlin is, it's just a cute little word that we use to describe some technical issues that come with broadcasting out of remote Africa. Um, but anyways, these things happen every now and then. We're driving through the lovely golden grass at the moment, but uh, we are edging closer and closer towards the hyena den. And we're not too far from the river road now, basically where the next line of trees is, is essentially where that highway is. And we'll jump on that, and that should take us to our destination relatively quickly. Although we've still got a bit of time to spare. What is the time? Quarter past, almost quarter past five Eastern African time. So yeah, I'm just trying to think it might take us, I'm try, oh, I don't know. It, again, the great thing about coming on a safari is that you have a plan to go and do one thing and it can easily change because you know you bump into something that's even more amazing. So who knows, we might see the Mogora pride, maybe we come across Scarface and his clan, or not my clan, his pride. <laughs> Speaking of hyenas. Now, Tannis, you've asked, what animal do I think I'm most like? I, um, I find this animal, this question hard to answer, so I'm gonna let you all answer it for me. Everyone says my spirit animal is, is a lion. So I think it's because I have lots of hair. But maybe you guys can come up with something quite funny and don't worry, I don't get offended easy, so go wild. Hashtag Safari Live or chat to us via the YouTube chat. <laughs> and uh, what do you think? What animal do you think I'm most like? Uh, now, Megan, who's directing this afternoon, has just said that she thinks I'm like an arena trogan because I'm most unique. Mm, thank you, Megan, that's very kind of you. I showed Megan an arena trogan yesterday when we went on a little safari parkour, a little exercise and hike, which was a lot of fun. So um, it was actually quite surprising. We heard a calling and then any, and ended up being right above us. It was so beautiful. Uh, in the only patch of light in the forest too. And normally with Narina trogans is that they're quite shy birds and they tend to hide themselves away and always turn their backs to you. So you always see the green, which makes them very difficult to spot up in the trees. But we were so lucky. I said to Megan, that's probably one of the best sightings of an arena trogan I've ever had. I have a video, but it's not gonna do much for you, unfortunately, because it was up in the trees above us, basically through a hole about that big and all you could see was the bright red of its breast and it was just looking down at us watching us and we stood there for five or six minutes just in absolute awe admiring it so i don't know if i'm quite as unique as a narina trogan because there's something quite special but thank you megan that was very kind of you here we have some waterbuck and giraffe typical well the giraffe sort of circling the outskirts of the marsh the waterbuck jumping straight into it. Let's have a have a little look see. <laughs> Kay, you said I'm like a jackal. Is it because I for some reason every time I see those jackal pups they run up to my car and circle me? I don't know why that is. I don't know if they do that to everybody or if they just do it to me. I like to think they just do it to me. It makes me feel a bit better about myself. Um, that's quite a good one. I might not be as quick as them, as good as catching grasshoppers though, but I do try. Now the waterbuck, I'm not worried about grasshoppers, however, they won't eat them. They are feeding on all the lovely lush grass in the marsh. And this is how you should be seeing waterbuck. You know, I've missed this, I haven't seen it for quite some time. The last time I'd see waterbuck in, in marshy sort of areas or wetlands was in Zambia, in Lozambezi National Park. But we typically don't see this in the Sabi sand. Unfortunately, there aren't enough areas uh, where, where they, I don't think there are any areas where there's marshes. I'm trying to think. Nope, not that I could think of. Everywhere that I've worked down on the sands didn't quite have a marshy area. So, so it is quite nice to see that again. That male has not lifted his head once. Now, this is quite interesting. Well, I find it quite fascinating. I don't know if you remember a few weeks ago, we were seeing two waterbuck um, bulls in this area. This is the same spot that Brent and I like to do a lot of birding. It's often when we see that Malachite Kingfisher, just, just for context. And we had two of them having a standoff. Remember that morning? It was beautiful in the golden light. And there were the other male, not this one, I think was much older. And he had much bigger horns, but he got chased away by this young upstart. And I think that that's quite nice to see that sometimes it's not always the biggest bull with the longest horns. 
I suppose it's all about your technique in terms of fighting and he must have won because he's still here with the same group of waterbuck that we see almost every single morning that we pass through on this river road. So very, very, very nice. It's also the same herd that I've pointed out to you a couple of times. I've said the females are looking quite big now and their bellies are bulging. So hopefully we'll start to see a few more uh, youngsters popping out. But remember, it will take a week, a week or two before they bring them back to the herd because they'll give birth off on their own and in, in, in the thickets. So we, we probably won't uh, see, well, we might actually see, let's see, let's count the females. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I can see nine here. There's no more on the other side of the road. I didn't count how many waterbuck females were here the last time that I saw them. So let's say that maybe one or two of them have already gone off to give birth because there was definitely one female that was very, very big. Right, I'm going to send you as quick as I can down to the Sabi Sand because Noel has got an exceptional sighting of a species of mongoose that I have not seen for a very long time. We just came across this really cool slender mongoose and he was finishing up the tail end of what looked like a lizard or a skink kill. And now it seems as if he's sniffing around trying to figure out if there's anything left for him to eat. Now unfortunately we just got the tail end of it and we're unable to put it on camera for you but it looks as if he's managing to find tiny little bits there. He was finishing off just there where he's smelling and now having a rest licking his chops from his lovely little meal. And I remember slender mongoose will eat snakes. They're very good at killing and eating snakes. They'll also eat uh, termites and large beetles. And of course now, as we've sort of shown you, the, um, the lizards as well. Now he might stick around long enough to groom and clean himself. Most species or most organisms, I should say, say after a meal will do a bit of cleaning, especially if the meal was a larger one, just to make sure everything's still in place. We see it often with birds. We see it with lion and leopard. But it's also true of our, our smaller mammals as well. There he's cleaning his paws off, making sure to get all the gunk. And it's interesting, he's not too far from us, so hes I think he's just checking to see what we're up to as well every now and then, just to make sure we don't invade his space, buzzle, his space bubble. I'm so sorry, I'm tripping over my words today, everybody. I'll drink some more water just now, that will help. As we're driving around, the, the breeze is even better, but as we sit still, the heat is pretty intense, I'm not gonna lie. Dries your mouth out. Also, this is a good sighting because we don't usually get to see slender mongoose often. Catherine, you're saying how cute the slender mongoose is. Yes, mongoose are, well, mongoose are, are cute, definitely cute little species. So there's been a raging debate between myself and uh, a few friends about what are we actually supposed to call a mongoose? Is it mongoose, mongooses, mongai? And then we were chatting with a biologist friend of ours and he was saying it's just mongoose. But I do catch myself from time to time saying mongoose. It would make sense because you go from goose to geese, but it's just mongoose. All right, fantastic, slender mongoose. Goose finishing up his kill there. We've picked up on a little bit of male leopard tracks and Vildi and I have been debating about who this male leopard could be. The tracks are rather large. Both of us are sort of hedging our bets towards Tingana, but the problem is these tracks are not very fresh. They're probably from last night and there's another vehicle that's driven on top of them. But in general, he's heading down this road. So another reason why we're thinking it's Tingana is the fact that because he's sticking to the road and he's going to the inside curves and the, the way that he's moving, this might actually turn, let me just see if I can find a nice little sequence up here. Um, means that there's possibly some scent marking that's happening, which would mean that it wouldn't be something like Tamba. Tamba is too small for scent marking and also the tracks are very large. So as we know, Tamba has big feet, but these feet are very big. Sorry, I'm just trying to see if I can find them for you again. I had one back there, but it wasn't the best to show on camera. No, I've lost them a little bit. It's possible that he cut around the curve here. Let me see as we go along if I can find you an, another nice sequence. Now, on a hot day like today, right now, it would be rare to find a leopard walking around. But that being said, I have friends that work in the Pilansburg National Park, uh, which is farther west and north from us in South Africa. And it's a park that sees quite a lot of 
traffic from private vehicles and something that they've found over the years that they've been working there is a lot of the leopard activity actually happens in the middle of the day when, when the vehicles tend to be resting um, and they tend to find leopards hunting in 40 degrees Celsius weather in the middle of the day, sort of 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. And it's an interesting scenario. So I don't know if there's something else that plays up with it. There's also quite a large lion population that's there. Um, there could be other mitigating factors. But my friends that work there are convinced it has to do with the amount of people that are coming into the park. Now we've got a beautiful kudu that's just up here, who is now on unfortunately moving away and I don't think we're going to be able to get too nice of a view. I think Brent's uh, comms have come back so let's head back up to him in the Maasai Mara and see what he can show us with those cheetahs. Sorry about all those gremlins with him but it seems to have sorted itself out so you must enjoy. Well yes unfortunately when we're a bit closer to them we couldn't hear final control but they absolutely smashed that little warthog in no time whatsoever they ate it all up it's pretty much done skis now and uh, I've been trying to check with my binoculars for the female but I think she's probably made good her escape I might go look for her a little later but I'm pretty sure she would have jogged but unfortunately for her if she keeps in that direction she's gonna run into Miale so Miale was in the direction where she started heading off with when the boys started chasing this a young warthog and uh, wow. if you're a warthog it's a bad day if you are a cheetah it's a lovely Sunday well human equivalent of a, a, a suckling pig I suppose um, so good for the boys they'll be quite happy with that although I don't think it's going to be enough to sate them I think they might uh, hunt again just now but it should keep them a little bit less hungry for a little while remember this is all 100% live uh, coming to you from the Maasai Mara and the Greater Kruger in South Africa and in Kenya we are sitting in the Maasai Mara. Of course, Tristan and Noel are sitting in uh, the Greater Kruger on Juma. And we've found our spotted cats. Well, we found eight different cheetah this afternoon. Let's hope that Noel and Tristan can find you guys some leopards uh, to finish off the big cat afternoon because we have seen lions already. So lions and cheetah. So we're relying on Noel and Tristan to find us some leopards and Tristan. No excuses today. So not all of them would have got a very good meal out of that. Oh, it sounds like we have a possible ID for the female. James Richard says that female might have been Rosetta, which is Rose's daughter. Now, I've never heard of either of those two cheetah, so there we go. You learn something new every day. Now, it looks like some of the boys are up and about already. That little warthog did not touch sides. Well, some of them are flopping down. Um, others are on the move. Now, you will see there are other vehicles enjoying the sighting with us. But you can see still quite an empty belly. Uh, a little pig that doesn't go far when there's five of you. Now, guys, I'd be heading the other way. There's a lot more game where I came from than across this side. Now, are you going to plonk or are you going to keep walking? That is the question. I've got a feeling they might plonk for a little bit. Or maybe not wasn't a very long chase for them so they wouldn't have utilized too much energy catching uh, that that little warthog <laughs> how's that for simultaneous sitting choreog a choreographed it has plonk our bottoms at the exact same time now d'artagnan the greedy guts that he is is the last to leave what is left of that little warthog There he is, 
striding towards the others. And apologies, we are right on the edge of uh, some of the signal. We're really down low in a in a river system, so hopefully the boys keep heading up, up, up and away towards a better signal and comms area. They normally do at this time of the day, they move out of the low-lying areas up towards the crests uh, following the prey species which normally do the same. And you can probably hear it's quite windy at the moment. Next, are you, what are you up to? Are you going to plonk? Yep, plonk. You never know what could happen next. Another poor unsuspecting warthog might wander towards them. We're going to keep an eye on the boys for now. Hopefully they do get moving. Otherwise, we do have plan B, C, and D now. Miale, the lions, and Rosetta, possibly. Well, that's her name. Uh, so we're going to see what happens here for a bit longer before we move on. While we do that, it sounds like McCurdy is racing off somewhere. Just trying to get to that hyena den and keep the skin. feels like it's getting further and further away. But Branch, you'll be happy to know, very, very briefly, you got to see this the straw-tailed wider. Yay! You've been telling me about it and you put one on screen the other day, which was very cool. And uh, we just passed Hippo Pools. Sadly, I didn't get to show all of you, but it was really nice to finally see. I've been quite lucky with the birds uh, this week in terms of how many new ones have actually added to the list which is really quite cool so there we go uh, was i supposed to go down there no the next one we'll go down the next one i think to get towards the um the hyena just checking here for any more birds this spot is quite nice although it's dried up quite a bit so they mustn't have had too much rain here last night a little bit it's a bit wet but no one's home. Normally there's a goliath heron that lives... I don't want to get stuck. Normally there's a goliath heron that's around here. No, no birds. Not even the Egyptian geese today. That's unusual. Remember, we've seen a couple of times I've stopped here and there's been a whole flock. Bless you, Craig. Bless you. Another one? No, just two. Okay. Now, Sinek, you're wondering what species of widow birds are found in Kenya. Shall we have a look? Let's bring the book out. Let's quickly have a look, because I can rattle off... Oh, sorry, it takes me a while to stop. I can rattle off all sorts of names, but I think it would be better if we actually took a look at them, don't you think? And luckily, widow birds should be right at the end, too. Where are we going to start? 686. 600 and... So quite far. 680. Sorry, my hair. My hair feels like spider webs sometimes on my face. Um, almost, I promise we're almost there. No, next page. Okay. Right. So, theoretically, the yellow crowned. No, that's a bishop. That's the one Brent has been telling me about that I need to keep an eye out on. So not that one. Here we go. Yellow mantled widow bird. So at number four down here on the bottom right. I'm so sorry, Craig. I, I can't even see my monitor at the moment. But that one there where my thumb is. Uh, that is one that we get to see. So we get quite a few down here. Let me go to the next page. 
Oh yes, these all look familiar. Then top left is the fan-tailed widow bird, which I think is the most common one that we're seeing at the moment. And the white-winged widow bird, which is number two. Have I seen that in South Africa? Yes, we see that in the Greater Kruger area. That's one that we see quite often. Might, it just occurs on the border of Kenya and Tanzania, um, in Tanzania. So maybe we'll see it down on the border. Number three, the red-collared widow bird. We most certainly see lots of them. And then the, yes, so there we go. So one, two, three, maybe a few more species of, of widow birds too. But the most common ones that we're seeing at the moment are the red collared, the fan tailed. Oh, and then where's the Jacksons? Why can't I find Jacksons? Oh, there's another page of widow birds. Brent is also telling me that I need to keep an eye out for number two, which is that one. Um, the Jackson's widow bird, which I haven't seen just yet, so I'll keep an eye out for that one. I think he said he, did he I don't know if he managed to put one on screen, but I know he was trying the other day. I don't think it was sitting still. But very cool. So there's a variety of widow bird species um, and that we get to see out here in the Mara. It was very nice. I think the only one that I haven't seen so far is the Jackson's. I really, really need to make an effort to go through my birds and figure out how many I've actually seen over the years because I've completely lost count. I also don't have my, well now with my Kenyan birds, I think I've probably seen quite a few more birds since I've been here in the Mara. But for me, it doesn't matter about numbers. It's just constantly learning about the new birds and seeing them. One day, when I'm bored, I'll eventually go through and count them all on a rainy day. Right, but I am going to send you back across uh, the Mara River. So we're going to go from the Triangle to the Masai Mara National Reserve. Brent is not letting those cheetah out of his sight. Well, welcome back, everyone. We're still sitting with the... Uh boys and as I predicted they have plonked for now doing a bit of grooming after their little piggy afternoon roast as I say it's going to be interesting to see if they hunt again I'm not sure that they're going to to be honest but you never know, and I think they are worth spending the time with this lot. They don't look quite settled just yet. There's quite a bit of up and down movement. Let's go across to the two grooming. There we go. Hello. Let's clean the blood off each other's faces. There we go, and there they are. Practicing a little bit of aloe grooming. Still definitely looking about to see if there's any potential prey around. Hello, Ben, who's nine years old. Um, ben, all I heard is that something, somebody told me that it was possibly your birthday. Unfortunately, I couldn't hear what your question was. It was a bit broken up, but happy birthday, Ben, who's nine years old. I think Megan is saying how fast, or what's a cheetah's maximum speed. Um, they are documented doing as much as 110 kilometers an hour, but that was quite a long time ago. Now it's thought that probably top speed is between 90 and 100 kilometers an hour. So it's still very, very fast and much faster than any people or any person could run. I think the fastest person ever recorded um, was Usain Bolt. And I think he's, I think it was 45 degrees. 45 kilometers per hour or something like that so well more than double what a human being can run We 
go. Some lovely tender moments from the boys. Now, these moments of aloe grooming, which it means sort of social grooming, are very important when it comes to re-establishing the bonds that they have while they often um, will fight and scrap with each other. So after those moments of fighting and scrapping, the, the little licks and loves uh, are to reaffirm that they're all still friends. Well, they're on the move, which is a good thing for us, and they're moving in a good area for us, because hopefully I'll be able to hear Megan if I go a little bit higher. Oh no, you know what they're doing? Cheeky cheetah. They're using the shade, well one is, using the shade of the safari vehicle to sleep in. Um, there's no trees around, so if there's a convenient safari vehicle, just let's lie in that shade. I thought they were going to keep moving, hopefully they will. But for the moment, they're lying in the shade of the safari vehicles. But I'm going to have to go up the hill a little bit to see if I can hear Megan. Oh. Okay, well, we're going to wait to see what these guys get up to. While we do that, it seems like Noel is with something that is a lot bigger and a lot scarier than a cheetah. We made it over to Chitwa Dam and it is a beautiful scene right now. We've got lots of hippos playing in the water. They're also enjoying this sunshine as well as this little bit of a breeze. We had one hippo that was out the water, but she climbed quickly back in as we came up. So these are the youngsters that have been um, uh, giving us such great antics the past few times we've been here. As they get older, they get more comfortable in their space and they get more playful. And then obviously a lot of the play that they're doing is going to help them later in life when they're all grown up, whether they're male or female, whether they need to defend their little ones or defend their territories as males. So hippos have a very thin epidermis, a very thin skin, and and they don't sweat. Like most of the mammal species we see out here, they don't sweat. And they have no hair to help protect them from the sun or the heat. So by staying in the in the water during the day, it makes up for all of this. It also is protecting their skin. Remember, their skin's very sensitive uh, because of that thin epidermis, because of that thin top layer of skin. So a lot of the times when you do see them out of the water, they appear quite pink. And that's that very special uh, secretion that they make that works like a sunscreen. It's, it's basically a mucus o over their skin. And um, they lose more water through their skin than any other mammal, which is something that we talk about. So if we were similar to a hippo and we lost as much moisture through our skin as, as they did, we would need to be in the water or in a moist environment often. Um, or else we would dehydrate excessively or desiccate. Desiccate's another word for dehydration. Usually desiccation refers to um, uh, lizard species and snakes and things like that, but we can also use it to, to, to work for us as well. And then of course because of all of this that's why they move outside the water when it's a cooler or a nighttime for their feeding practices to mitigate all their circumstances. Other animals that live in sort of dry, very very dry areas that have uh, the probability of possibly dehydrating will also do a lot of their feeding at night something like a chemsbok or even springbok uh, which we don't get here but in, in more arid areas they'll do something similar and they get a lot of the moisture they need from eating the plants during the time of the the evening or early morning where the dew collects now just right in front of our car maybe two meters from our vehicle we have a beautiful little pranton call that's sitting here in some old elephant dung and these pranton calls i'm i look before i moved here i saw pranton calls every now and then but we have these ones that nest in this area we that really great uh, sighting of uh, an egg maybe about a month or so ago and then every time i've popped up here i keep seeing them but i haven't seen any chicks yet and i have a feeling that not many of the eggs have survived because this is where the elephants like to walk down when they come to drink and obviously elephants have a very big feet and so it can sometimes be difficult for these birds to keep their eggs alive because remember they're not making a nest it's just a tiny little scraping in the ground and then putting that egg right there and the egg is meant to camouflage
Kevin, you're curious to know, are there any crocodiles here at Chitwa Dam? There are crocs, and I'm actually having a look around from our vantage point right now to see if we can see any. I'm not seeing any from here. They could possibly be in the water, or they could be up on the island where I cannot see. Or, Vildi, did you see one on the other side there? Yeah, we're just checking. Oh, there's some bush buck on the other side there. Again, an antelope species we don't see often. They like to hide in the thick bush. These ones particularly like to be around the dam. And just on the right-hand side of your screen as well, there's a spoonbill, that white bird with a spatula-type bill. And then it looks like some white-faced whistling ducks and maybe an ibis that's over there on the side. It's quite far away from where we are. It's on the strip of uh, Chitwa Main Lodge there. Just checking the rocks that side. Willow, who's three years old. Hello, Willow. You're curious to know if hippos talk to each other. And I'm not quite sure if you heard all that grunting that just happened now. Willow, they do indeed talk to, the, to each other. Most organisms communicate with each other in some manner. Hippos outside the water make that funny laughing grunt sound that we just heard a little bit of now. And then they also communicate underneath the water. They, it's, they're related to, hippo, to, to whales. Hippos are related to whales. They're in the same order. So all of the organisms that we work with, so whether we're human or we're a bird or we're a plant or we're a hippo we all have these different sequences that we fit into and so hippos and whales are cousins of each other and I'm not sure if you've ever heard whale song under the water I'm gonna do my best to imitate but it's a sort of singing noise and hippos will do that underwater in a similar fashion there they laugh a little bit there um, using their their lower jawbone they're able to communicate that way with vibrations yes it's such a beautiful afternoon here Willow I don't know if you're coming to us from the States but if you are when I was a kid there was a really wonderful program with Ben Affleck called Voyage of the Mimi and there's some really great stuff on humpback whales from there I don't know maybe you guys can google it with your mom and I think you'd find that super interesting so while we're busy looking for things like crocodiles and maybe a little Hasana here at Chitwa Dam. Let's head on over to Tristan and see what he's up to. Well, I'm busy watching a poor African harrier hawk or a gymnogene, for any of you that remember the old name, being mobbed and chased by multiple forktail drongos. You can see the little drongos dive bombing this poor African harrier hawk, and the reason why they're doing that is because the harrier hawk obviously is a bird hunter, and so it goes into the nests and goes and hunts all of their little chicks and things like that, and so it gets disciplined very quickly by the forktail drongos. It gets chased away and is made to get out of the area and to to try and go somewhere else. Now the reason why we know it's an African harrier hawk, as you see it bank like that into the light, you can really get a nice indication of its coloration. It's got that grey colour with those yellow legs and face mask which can change to red sometimes when they're in breeding phase. And then it's got a very heavily broad barred tail, so white and black on the tail itself which is very very cool. So it's a it's a beautiful bird to see and, and we often see them around quarantine and various other parts of the reserve going from marula tree to marula tree sticking their long legs inside those trees to try and get into the nests and, and try and find things like squirrels, babies and obviously chicks of birds and that's why the birds get a little upset with them and try and kind of chase them away and send them somewhere else. But that was very good. Well done Darby. Good camera work there. It's not easy to follow a soaring bird they look like they just kind of circling very slowly but they actually move incredibly fast particularly when they are being chased by other birds but so far no luck on Tundi we've done a few loops around I drove where James said he saw Tundi and Cub this morning and while there are tracks absolutely everywhere we haven't been able to find anything as yet we've seen you know where she was moving up and down there are tra tracks for the little cub there's tracks for her it looks like they might have gone north again and into towards sort of Rebecca's side and westwards and maybe she's got a kill somewhere there I'm not sure so I'm just trying to do a few loops now towards sort of Treehouse Dam, Zoe's Road, just to make sure she hasn't popped out in any of those areas. If she has, well then we'll be able to pick up tracks and follow them from there, but otherwise we'll just keep looping around and as it gets cooler, hopefully that's going to mean she is going to start moving and either go for some water or maybe just go back to a cub or maybe back to a kill that she might potentially have. 
Right, well, I will be going towards Treehouse Dam now and trying to search for what I am looking for. But it seems that Taylor McCurdy has managed to find what she was looking for. And hopefully, it's a very active den. We raced on over because I was worried that we were going to start running out of time because it gets so dark so quickly. We were, of course, talking about that. Hello, little one. You seem to be very excited. Nudging up to that female. That one's just come out of the den. Now, it looks so... <laughs> yes. I don't think that's your mum. Uh, there is a, a young cub that is suckling at the moment, just hiding in the grass, that is slightly older than this, uh, the little one that's being a bit cheeky. Remember how I've said there's clearly one young hyena cub that's still quite black in colour, that's probably between five and seven weeks old, somewhere around there, that it walks around like it owns the place, and I can only imagine it must be one of the higher ranking females uh, cubs, but there's not many adults around, so you better be careful when mum's not home uh, to be quite cheeky towards the other adults. But the rest of them are undercover at the moment. They're hiding away from the wind that's here. And I suppose it would be quite nice and cozy uh, down in that burrow. We did also see two other hyena closer towards the road. They, they look, actually look like males to me. Uh, they could have also just been very young females, but uh, not too close to the den. So they do scatter themselves out, like we said, and it is hard to spot them. So mom could be around here somewhere. Also a herd of elephants, I think, moved through. We can still see the elephants, but we, I think we would have missed the interaction maybe about 15, 20 minutes, unfortunately. You can see them just off into the distance. I think they would have come straight through this den. That would have also sent the hyenas running. And I'm sure the youngsters would be very nervous of encountering these large giants and maybe you know, actually got a bit of a fright and sent them down into that burrow. So I, it does, it's not particularly active at the moment. Now 15 seconds, you said you found, oh, you find hyenas very interesting. I do too. And that's why we spend so much time at the den sites when we can. Unfortunately, they're not always active when we want them to be, like right now. At least it, it, it's a little bit of a sight of a hyena, just to get your fix, of course. But they are really fascinating creatures. And, and I like to spend a bit of time with them because I think there's a, a whole lot that I don't know about hyenas. Uh, it goes on behind the scenes. So I always look forward and I sit pretty much with my notebook in hand and my pen, waiting and watching uh, the various behaviors that I, uh, that I see. And hopefully I'll start to get to know the individuals of the North Clan and and then go from there. But for now they're very relaxed, just suckling away, filling up that belly before the adults have to search for some food again. It all starts again. Of course it's a big routine. Come back, feed the cubs, go off, look for some dinner, come back to the den. Sometimes they don't come back to the den for a you know, day or two. But we'll sit here for a... No, never mind. <laughs> what I have spotted that looks like it's a little bit more interesting is just to the right of that hyena up on the shrub is a white-browed kukul. We've been seeing lots of them at the moment. Hello. We've been seeing lots of juveniles too, which has been quite fascinating. Something we saw that the other morning and I'd said to you how I'd never seen a juvenile white-browed kukuls before. Not alarming at the hyenas. I would imagine that this one lives within the vicinity and sees them often. Now, a bird would not necessarily be on a hyena's menu. And even though they are very, very good hunters, we don't typically see them going after the avian species. However, to a young leopard or a lion cub, of course, they'd be quite entertaining. I can't say that I've ever seen young hyenas sort of chasing around birds like we see with leopards and lions, for example, or... Um, oh no, I've never seen that before. I don't think that there's any need for them to be chasing after, after those characters. Just here, yeah. <laughs> listening to the elephants feed now as well. A few little sisticulars and things shouting. I'm not sure what they're shouting about. I don't think it would necessarily be the hyenas. Now, Dave, you're wondering if a hyena would ever hunt alone? But possibly. If um, a male is out on his own, or oh, there's two cubs there, I didn't even see them, they're so camouflaged. Um, I've actually, I don't know if I've seen hyenas hunting and chasing kudu around, because we used to see that a lot down at Sabi Sabi. The kudu were petrified 
of the hyenas and I have seen hyenas chasing kudu on quarantine which is that big open plain that you see down in Juma in South Africa um, but I haven't seen one on its own before it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me though remember hyenas are not necessarily always together they, they do spread out right what's happening now girl you done suckling your cubs they do look like they've got nice full bellies and there is another actually there's a sub adult going towards that kukul that's quite funny there we go look it's actually looking at the kukul you can't see it right now it's quite camouflaged but it's still in that shrub and it, it wasn't really oh you might have just seen it duck down into the left of that shrub it's showing are you being a bit curious it is a bit curious here we go here's something i've never seen before and it, isn't it fitting that we were just talking about youngsters perhaps chasing after birds not pouncing in there like a young cat would but just investigating just having a little smell and i'm sure if a bird got too close maybe they would snap at it and try and catch it but i don't i don't feel like they would go chasing after it there's so many other obviously hyena cubs that they can play with one another they can keep themselves entertained and i suppose that's what's quite nice about living in a family whether it's a clan or a pride whereas the adults don't have that much of a responsibility to keep their youngsters entertained they can kind of rely on the other youngsters in the group to entertain one another we see that with lions as well whereas leopards it's a little bit different mom has got a huge responsibility and even with cheetah you know if it's just mom and one cub she's got to play with them she's got to keep them entertained all the time hello fluffy Oh, there's a few more starting to pop out. Oh, they're so sweet. I love them when they're that age. I miss Tima so much. That was a very sweet little hyena. There we go. Being quite affectionate to one another. Just sort of smelling and licking. Where's that bossy cub that was out here a moment ago? I'm sure it'll come through and stir a bit of trouble. Like it always seems to do. It's like the floppy-eared cub of the hyena clan. <laughs> Right, we'll stay here for a little bit longer because it seems as though the cubs are starting to emerge from the den. Will they come up to the car? I'm not sure. However, Brent is still keeping a watchful eye on the cheetah. I am, but a, a watchful eye from a long distance. Uh, unfortunately, the, the comms gremlins down in that valley are, are very bad. So I've just managed to put myself in a position where we can still keep an eye on them. And uh, it does look like they might get moving again shortly. So we're just sitting probably about 500 meters from them on top of a little hill where I can hear Megs talk to us. So there we go, they are moving. Now I'm hoping that they do come up towards us here, although there's not much to eat up here. Oh, and hopefully they, they don't cross the lugger again because that could be interesting for us. We just managed to get through. Now the main crossing at the lugger is uh, someone is stuck in the crossing now. So there's a whole big traffic jam of people trying to get towards the boys, but they can't get there because someone's got stuck in the crossing. We made our own crossing, of course, but I don't want to do that crossing more than once. It was quite hairy the first time. But it does look like they are slightly sloping upwards uh, towards us. Well, towards the, the top of the hill. So let's just move around a bit. Okay. So it looks like they might come up towards the angle here. So I'm just going to keep up, up high for the moment. And uh, I can still keep an eye on them. Oh, big hole. So it looks like they are almost sort of heading towards, there's a lone tree over there. Uh, that seems to be the direction. Now they could go floppity flop before then, but all five seem to be up at the moment. And it looks like we might be in for some more rain again this evening. Fortunately, it's still quite far away. <coughs> uh, hopefully they will come back into a good comms area shortly. 
the general direction does seem to be up towards Kissinger's. Well, Kissinger's is quite far away, but that's the direction they're heading, towards sort of Kikarok. Now, we will stay with them as long as possible so we know where to look tomorrow morning. And as you can see, there are other vehicles also enjoying the sighting. And we do apologize for having them in shot, but um, we have to stay quite far away for now. Um, hopefully they... No, don't sit down. No, keep moving. There we go. Good boys. Alan is wondering about one of our favorite cheetah. Malaika. He saw a video of her jumping on a safari car and uh, wondering what are the rules about that. It's naughty. Um, Alan, so, I mean, if she jumped on our car, it'd probably be, uh, well, she jumps on a lot of cars. Um, I don't let her jump on my car. If she tries to jump on my car, I just tap the side like this or start the car to stop her doing that. Um, but certain people will let, 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 let her do that. So the problem is, is that one day there might be a small child in that car or a very scared person who reacts badly causing her to react badly oh dear did they flop down into the grass no <laughs> okay guys it looks like they're gonna oh no there's still two up um but yeah so it's it's not ideal let's put it that way uh, it's discouraged heavily uh, by the the park officials uh, just in case something happens. Oh my goodness. There's people stuck all over the place. <laughs> Sorry, I find it amusing. Um, two crossings above. Uh, it seems like they've managed to get out of the one crossing while someone's tried to cross the next crossing. And they've got stuck. <laughs> I know I probably shouldn't laugh at other people's discomfort, but it is quite funny. Okay, well, we get, it looks like they're going flat for now. We're going to sit here, play the patience game for a little longer. Uh, while we do that, let's go. Zooming all the way back to South Africa with Noel and a kingfisher. We have a beautiful woodland kingfisher that has been diving into the water, not for fish, but to clean itself, to bathe. Woodland kingfisher in general don't eat fish. They are insectivorous. They eat insects. And this one has just found a beautiful little shady spot to every now and then jump in. But Vildi and I gave each other a little bit of a fright just now. We have found the crocodile and we were busy doing a delay test. So I have to clap my hands for a delay test so we know how far uh, the, the, the voiceovers carry between us and the Mara. <laughs> and the croc was right here at the edge of the water. You can just see little bubbles sort of going away now. And <laughs> this croc like dived off. We didn't see it. <laughs> It's moving away under there. All right, <clears throat> so we don't always get a chance to talk about fish because fish are not always something that we see, but I thought since we're here at Chitwood Dam, fish might be a good thing to talk about. About 40% of all the fish worldwide are freshwater fish, so those are fish that we would live in here. Now, something interesting about South Africa is that 25% of the freshwater fish that we find in places like this are actually not fish from South Africa. They're alien invasive species fish like bass. Bass, for instance, is an alien invasive invasive species. Now something like that crocodile that just gave us a little bit of a scare and something like the egret that is across in this tiny little bit of vegetation over there, they're going to eat fish. And we have forms of tilapia here as well as you should find perch every now and then in here and then there's another one that's tickling my head. It's Jack and it, I, I had the name just now and it's escaping me. Um, we, another alien invasive species fish we have is carp. Um, and a friend of mine fishes them a lot and he always feels good about himself. Sorry everyone. Ooh, there's the woodland kingfisher. I'm going to take you away just because I can see the crocodile now again. It's just busy moving underneath this little bit of vegetation. Just see the top of the head there. 
So a large croc like this will eat mammal species like impala, but it will very much eat larger fish as well. And when you were asking about crocs, I'm actually hoping that this one will get up onto the island here. It does enjoy being up the side. Now a larger croc like this, let's say it got a small to medium size impala, might be a little bit big for it, but let's just say it did that. That meal could last it for a long time, but let's say for, for uh, hypothetical reasons, it couldn't get anything like that. Eating things like the fish that are in this dam are going to sustain it throughout the year. Now a lot of times in, in Southern Africa, you'll find that crocodiles estivate, which is a type of hibernation when winter time is cold and dry as opposed to cold and wet which happens in a lot of the northern hemisphere places and they'll dig themselves uh, into the banks of, of dams like this or sometimes they'll go inside termite mounds. That kingfisher really wants to be heard. I hope you can all hear that in the background. Um, but sometimes you'll find that even through the winter months You'll still see crocs in large dams like this still moving about because the food resources are still readily available. I feel like I'm competing with this woodland kingfisher at the moment. Go ahead, sir. No, he's done. He's now preening himself. <laughs> and, um, and so you'll get movement throughout the year as opposed to areas where the water will sort of disappear during the dry season and then the croc lowers its body temperature to almost non-existent, its heart rate to almost non-existent and, and, and does that hibernation. Now, Vildi, we might be a bit too far away, but there's a tiny little baby hippo that's starting to come out of the water there. Let's see if we can see this baby hippo for a little bit as he comes out. You can see that pink coloration that we were talking about. Now he doesn't have any playmates, playmates over there, he's just playing by himself and investigating his surroundings. But I believe my friend Tristan has some elephants that we've been searching for, so I think let's head on over to him and have a look. Indeed we do. We came across not one, not two, but many elephants and they stretched out all the way from Trias Dam going sort of in a westerly direction and north, south, everywhere we look there was Ellie's around and so we've caught up with the majority of the herd except that they are now disappearing into the thickets. Of course they would, they were all out on the road a few seconds ago and then when it's time for them to put on a show, well they've decided nope, it's time for some shade and a bit of feeding but you can see little trunks sticking through and they are ever so tentatively feeding off one of these weeping wattles that still has a few flowers on it so they're trying to find some of those yellow flowers to feed on. Now what I might do is just quickly reposition ourselves so we get a slightly better view because most of our Ellie's are quite hidden so I just want to try and kind of go around them a little bit if Rusty would decide to go into reverse because Rusty doesn't feel like going into reverse sometimes and so you have to kind of be a bit rough with Rusty and get Rusty to actually do what you ask it to do but that's okay we are good friends by now we've made up after Rusty ejected me from the vehicle and I took it through some thickets so we now have had one for one and we're all good and so everything is okay now hopefully if I can just get around this area and position myself slightly in front of this herd we'll be able to get them all kind of walking towards us that's the idea anyway whether or not it works I'm not quite sure but let's see how we go I'm also trying to just look for a little bit of shade for Dave and I because it is fairly warm in the Sun and so a little bit of shade would be thoroughly welcome in a day or on a day like today should I say not in a day that's not very good English and James will he's already beaten me once in ping pong will probably beat me again if I carry on using English like that so I'm gonna try and sort myself out Darby I think if we go around this bush then we should be good then they should be walking straight towards us from here I can see some of them coming out I just want to try and position ourselves slightly better this little gap here should be good nice little bit of shade I think we're gonna be in a winning situation here Darby here we go Let's try to go around this little bush here. And there we go. That's better, isn't it? 
it's not the best shade that I could have found. There's still a bit of sun on us. I think Dave's probably got more shade than I do, but at least the alleys are all nice and clearly visible, and you can see that they have had a fabulous time, probably at Trias Dam, maybe even at the Shabam or Mud Wallows, but they've all absolutely covered in not only mud, but in water too. So they've, wherever they've been, they've had a really good bathe, and, and it's needed on a day like today if you're a big, large animal like an elephant you do need a bit of water to try and kind of cool you down as well as a bit of mud now campus you want to know what is the most dangerous animal to encounter in a vehicle well you're probably looking at it so elephants in vehicles can be incredibly dangerous they're animals that possess serious amounts of power they are able to easily turn over a vehicle no problem and you have a situation where they are you know sometimes very defensive of their young ones as well as they might have had a fight if it's a male with another male or they're in a condition called must which is a heightened level of testosterone and therefore they can be a little bit temperamental and when they decide to take you on well we're no match for them even in a car they'll easily be able to flip a vehicle and, and throw all the occupants out as well as mangle it into a piece of tin foil basically and so an Ellie is by far the most dangerous for us out here in vehicles probably closely followed by buffalo and hippos which sounds really odd but the two of them can be a little bit feisty buffalo not so much because they want to attack cars but they normally cause damage to vehicles when being chased by lions and they blindly panic and run particularly at night and then they can hit quite a few vehicles all right well we're going to sit with our ellies because there's nothing better really i suppose maybe a leopard with the elephants would be better but sitting with ellies and enjoying their company on a warm afternoon is a wonderful way to spend the day it's very relaxing and so we're going to spend time here and while we do that let's send you back over to taylor mccurdy and the cuteness that is those little spotted hyenas There's no better way, Tristan, than to describe the hyenas the way you've just done. I also think that they are adorable. Now, I can understand why people don't think they're so precious when they, well, they get older. But at this age, you cannot tell me that looking at these fluffy creatures, especially the two on the left, they're very, very, very cute. They're just sort of staring at us at the moment. Tell me that that's not precious. That is absolutely adorable. And it's getting windy and it's getting cold now. I'm surprised that they've actually come out. Thank you, little hyenas. There comes a naughty one. Just popping out of the, the den now. There's two naughty ones just sitting at the entrance there. I still don't know how many cubs are in this clan. I think I've seen a few more. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm pretty sure we've seen a few more than this. Did we count like nine or ten hyena cubs the other day? I can't even remember. But perhaps between Rolf and I we can try and figure it out. And whoever else comes to the den. Oh, they are so sweet. But being very, very quiet. We've had some very interesting sightings over the last few weeks coming here. And they've been very busy. There's been a lot of fighting that's going on. So it, it is nice to see all peace and quiet. I say that. And then those two no, they're starting to bite one another. I think they're fighting over that stick that's just coming out of the ground. It must be a, a root of a plant. Or perhaps a stem of a plant. Well, they're both going to chew on it. It's amazing how they didn't even acknowledge it, but as soon as one finds something, it's like kids. If you give them a one toy, everybody wants to play with it. Except that one that's walking away. That one's not interested. I think it's going to go and bother that older cub now. Joy, you said that they are such characters. They most certainly are. Ooh, that, that cuckoo has landed on the ground. I wonder if that little hyena has actually seen it because it's marching over in that direction. Let's see if that youngster has spotted it yet and what its reaction is going to be. I don't think it's seen it. Oh, there we go. Oh, look at that. Did you see how its behavior changed very quickly? There we go. Now we'll find out if hyena cubs chase birds or not. I could have been completely wrong. Very excited by it, though. <laughs> He's stalking, <laughs> hiding. Maybe it's going to shoot out of that hole and race towards that kukul. However, that little hyena cub is not going to be quick enough to catch that kukul, I can assure you. And I think that's why that kukul knows that it's quite safe playing around on the ground. Most of the youngsters are out in the open where it can see. An adult hyena won't be interested in that bird. Let's see. No, no interest whatsoever. It's just popping back out again. 
Right, well, it's been a beautiful afternoon with the hyena cubs. I think we'll come back here first thing tomorrow morning and hopefully spend a bit more time with them. Perhaps you'll see some more action. Noelle is down in South Africa, as you know. She hasn't got a leopard, but she's got something that has got lots and lots of feathers. There you go. Hello everyone, we have come over to the other side of Chitwa Dam and we found a really nice view of an African Jacana. We are just trying, it keeps moving down the way here. Let me just see, there we go, let's get a view there. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. It's been hunting around the edges here for aquatic insects and also non-aquatic insects. Notice the large, large feet to help it through muddy areas. It also allows it to stand on top of floating vegetation like water lilies. And this bird's, ooh, there it gets an aquatic insect there. And you just saw another one floating past. Aquatic insects are really interesting. Um, they need to breathe still, but they have different ways of being able to breathe. So for them to habitat these areas that this, oh, we got one, that this jacana is fishing in, um, they can attain the water underwater from plants using a snorkel. They can also fill up their lungs and then they stay underwater for long periods of time. Or some of them have evolved self-contained underwater breathing mechanisms like some spiders and some adult insects and they trap air bubbles over their spiracles. Their spiracles are how they breathe. And then mosquito larvae are quite interesting. They have a sharp spiracles to penetrate plants to get air bubbles, or they use a snorkel on their back end um, that they hang upside down in and then get water that way. Also, some aquatic beetles trap air underneath their wings. So all of those insects are able to live in this habitat. And then because they can live and breathe in this habitat, something like this jacana is able to obtain food sources. And then its body has developed to be able to access some of their um, species that other birds wouldn't necessarily be able to do because of the foot structure and where it can live. David, you're saying this is now number 47 on your list. Fantastic. I'm hoping that's 47 for 2018. That's a good list so far. Tristan and I were talking today. Tristan's going on leave soon and I asked him what he was doing and he's good. Oh, there. I caught one there. Nice little aquatic insect. Tristan's going to go birding in the Kruger National Park and he's going to go look for some uh, lifers there. And I'm very jealous of the lifer list that he's aiming for this leave. And if he gets some, I'm going to then have to go on leave very shortly and, <laughs> and try and, and tick them off as well. Now, jacanas are polyandrous, so basically what happens, the female will come and lay eggs, and then she goes away, and then she does it with another male, and then another male, and then another male, and then the males all are the ones that take care of the chicks, interestingly enough. Happens in some bird species, but not many, and happens in very few mammal species, if any. So I was also watching this Chicana earlier. It was picking insects off a dead log that were non-aquatic insects, but I think he's found a nice little spot to access them at the moment. Another fish, we were talking about fish earlier and I forgot about this one. Another fish that we would find in a lake like this or a dam like this would be a barbel or a catfish found a catfish uh, carcass here the other day, most likely brought up by something like a fish eagle. This chicana won't necessarily eat that catfish, but many of the other bird species might scavenge off of it. Gorgeous, absolutely fantastic. Well, that was a special little sighting. Vildi is very keen for some leopard. I am also very keen for some leopard. So we're gonna carry on and go have a look. And we're gonna head back over to Tristan, who's still with his elephants. I am indeed, and they are slowly but surely coming right past the front of the car. So we've got a few of them right next to us, right here. So you can see they're very, very close. So I'm trying not to move too much with them. But the whole herd is just slowly but surely tracking across the front side of the vehicle. And I was hoping that we would get them all coming past. It's a beautiful, relaxed herd. They first, they were a little kind of nervous of us. So we saw a situation where there was a few ears that were out and a little bit of sort of hesitancy from them. But 
birds. Now they've all relaxed quite nicely and we've got a beautiful view of this, not a huge herd, but at least a decent sized herd coming past. You can see some of the youngsters are now filing out of the background and the adults are still sitting feeding all around us. And you can see they don't spend long in the sun. As soon as they get into the sun, they start moving quite quickly because otherwise it just gets too warm. And even though they have this incredible ability to cool their body down with their ears, they still are having to try and and just kind of get out into some semblance of shade now excuse my head there i had it in frame i'm trying to duck down but it is very very difficult when there's ellies all around you and so it was a little bit tough sorry darby it was my fault but there's i think a little baby in amongst there yes there's the little tiny one see how cute that is that's a fairly newborn baby i would say maybe a couple months old if that and it's a fairly active little thing as well it keeps following everybody around all over the place right dave let's reposition once again because they've now abruptly moved past us and we've had news as well for those of you that are wondering about the Inkuhuma pride now the Inkuhuma pride for some reason I don't know if James found their tracks today but Drexen reckons their tracks are from during the day today have walked through Juma and have crossed into Arethusa chasing buffalo so I was hoping we would be able to find them he said the tracks were heading in this direction so that's why I was just sitting with these elephants in the hope that maybe the elephants would help me find them in one of these blocks but it seems as though they've crossed into Arethusa on the trail of some buffalo and so we're not going to be able to find the Inkuhumas today, which is very, very sad. I actually don't even know the last time I saw the Inkuhuma Pride. Actually, I do. Sorry, I lie. The Inkuhuma Pride, the last time I saw them was when we were in rehearsals for TV, which was at the beginning of December. And so I haven't seen the Inkuhuma Pride for quite some time and really have spent very little time with them over the course of the last year. So it would be really nice if they did decide that it would be pleasant to come back to Juma and not stay away as much as they have over the last little bit. Right, so this should get better now, Davi. I'm just going to try to get around once more. So what we're trying to do is just try and kind of head around the herd a little bit and then just park not in their way but just park close by and just watch them kind of come past us in a sort of 45 degree angle that's the idea behind this anyway whether or not it works we shall soon find out but at least we have a fairly nice view from where we're sitting now you can see they're just kind of coming broadside to us at the moment and it is the most beautiful day big blue skies green summery bush and the gray ghosts of Africa moving through it's just one of the best ways to spend a day look at that isn't that picturesque it certainly is a stunning summer's day you couldn't ask for much better and thank goodness there's a bit of a breeze as well because otherwise it would be stiflingly hot but the Yalies look fairly relaxed about life as well they have had their mud wallow so they'll be cooled down and well for them it's just a bounty of food at the moment as they move through these green grasses and these treed areas with lots of foliage it's like a mixed salad on buffet for them so they've kind of just move in and they just take whatever they want with their trunks and they will be quite selective about what they feed off at this time of the year because they've got so much to choose from they can find the tastiest treats and so you see there she's kicked up a small acacia tree and those will be the tastiest leaves that she has out here what amazes me is that if I had to go and pick up that tree or any one of you you would lacerate your hands or completely but yet that elephant has just shoved that entire tree into its mouth with no worries whatsoever and eaten it all so it just goes to show you how hard their palate is but they absolutely love those acacias it's one of their favorite things to eat and particularly in the summer months if they've got a few flowers on them they get these tiny little yellow flowers that are full with nectar and they absolutely love them and you'll find that they'll chomp them down the one in the back though is targeting some guinea grass by the looks of things and it's got beautiful sticky sweet seed on it and that is also fairly tasty if you're an elephant so lots to eat here and, and really good nutrition for all of them as they kind of work their way through the thickets from water point to water point because I'm pretty sure this herd is going to start heading towards Red Dam that's where the kind of angle that they're going in at the moment is that they'll go past Duma and into Arethusa towards that dam and this is how elephants go at this time of the year when it's very hot as they literally just feed their way from one water source to the other where they'll top up water and they'll then cool themselves down and then carry on again with the feeding process to satisfy that massive gut system that they've got 
very cool you can see how completely relaxed they've become now so it started out that they were a bit kind of oh, there's a vehicle in amongst us and they were paying attention to us whereas now you can see everybody is completely calm and they're just doing their own thing and that's one of the nicest things about being out here with the Ellies in this particular part of the world is that most of them are super relaxed and you get these intimate sort of moments where you're in amongst the Ellies they're all around you and it's just the nicest thing to do and to spend time so a perfect way to spend a Sunday afternoon in my opinion it's actually quite nice just listening to them ripping up bits of grass I'm not sure if you guys can hear it but as they pull up tufts you can just hear this ripping and then the slow walking as they kind of go through it and then every now and then leaves brushing on their skin it's a lovely sound to listen to and that coupled by the breeze is like I say a very very pleasant way to spend the afternoon now funny enough actually where these elephants are standing right now just to the right of them on the ground you'll see a big sandy patch that's there so that area over there Davi now that little patch there if some of you may remember a few months ago is where Shadow went chasing after a warthog and she was digging around in there and as she turned her back and walked away the warthog came flying out so if she'd just been a little bit more patient she might have gotten lucky but it's amazing to see the difference when we filmed that there was absolutely no grass around it and it was a fairly bare patch now it's incredibly well hidden I only just noticed it now as the early kind of walked past that it's exactly that spot where we had shadow digging for war dogs so amazing how things change in the summer months right Darby let's just reposition slightly so we're going to try and get ourselves into a different area once again to see there's a nice little gap here that we can go on there's a lovely big game path I must remember this game path because I'm pretty sure we don't want to go in there. No, that's not where we want to go, Darby. That's going to be a big hole that is in there. But I was going to say that these game paths are really good for a lot of our predators. Now, I'm trying to see how big a game path we've got. Ah, there we go. That's okay. So it's a nice big aardvark burrow that is here. So it's difficult to see, but uh, maybe you can see it. But basically, it goes in like this. So we park now on top, and this will be done by aardvarks or something like a porcupine. They'll also dig there. And so every now and then, if you're not paying attention too much and you're not really looking, you can end up inside one of those. And I actually had a friend of mine that was once being chased by a buffalo and he was running away from the buffalo and as he was running away he ended up in a situation where he fell down one of those and thank goodness he did because if it wasn't for that the buffalo would have gotten him and he managed to fall down these odd arc holes right let me reposition myself and while I do that let's go back across to Brent Leo Smith and his well, I think he's left the cheetah now and is probably racing home and trying to get out of the way of a rather large storm. Look at that. Look at that. That is a massive wall of dust that's being... ...stop for only a second. Apologies. Intermittent black... And we're already starting to get raindrops, but that red there, that is dust. That is a monster. And I need... We're going to be in the car tonight because the rivers will be too flooded uh, to cross. So I'm, I'm going to keep moving. Now... Oh, Miale is chasing something. There go the cheetah. Hang on, hang on, hang on. There's a cheetah chasing. There's a cheetah hunt going on. Hang on. It's a long way away. I just saw Miale shoot out of the bush she was in and take off at high speed. So... ...and came out of that bush. Yes, we are. It's where the cheetah Maybe we're going to get our second cheetah kill in a day. Or in the afternoon, actually. Oh, rain, go away. Rain, go away. Just wait till it let me find the cheetah.
She missed. It looks like she missed. Where are my binoculars? Where are my binoculars? Binos, binos, where are you? Is that her there? It definitely looks like it. Yeah, she missed. Did you see her? You see her, Adrian? Just hang on, go back. Zoom. Right in the center of the screen. There, where my finger is. She missed whatever she was chasing. Oh dear, so much excitement right at the end of the safari. But now I am going to make a like a cheetah, uh, probably not drive as fast, um, but I'm gonna try get away from that storm before it hits us. And uh, there we go, Adrian's gonna give you one last look. There's a, the rainbow, the wall of dust and the massive storm behind. Isn't that beautiful actually, let's just take a moment. <sighs> Stunning, now I really have to dash. Let's go back to Tristan.